we're going to do things a little different than, than is in the syllabus. This is something I plan to do, but I forgot to update the syllabus. Um, so we'll talk about that in a minute. First of all, is there any questions about the activity that we had on Wednesday? It, it looked like both of you guys got it pretty well, at least using the mobile first. Um, the other way around, the graceful degradation, is essentially just the opposite. You put the, um, you make the default style sheet have everything in it, the full blown, and then you create a second style sheet with a, a media query to remove things, um, depending like for lower resolute, for, for lower uh, size screens and for, for mobile devices. Generally, the better approach to take is a mobile first. But if you're starting with an existing website that is the full version is completed, sometimes you have to, sometimes it's easier to do the, um, the um, graceful degradation. All right. Let me talk about in general what we're going to do, and then we will get into this particular aspect of it. <clears throat> if you had me for any class, you probably saw, you probably seen me draw my famous diagram. of how the client and server interact. I remember saying my first year here that I'm going to trip over one of these cables one of these times, and this is the first time it happened. What is this? Yeah, exactly. That would have been embarrassing. I don't even know what this is. I'm going to get on. You know, this is Huffman's room. He really is not doing a good job keeping stuff up. Have you ever seen they have, for networking folks, they have like the best server room and the messiest server room. You know, some of them like with all the cables are like labeled and they're color coded. And then others are like this, you know, a pile of cables that, that connect things together. All right. Um, anyhow, my famous diagram. My famous diagram that we talk about is how the client... Whoever the client may be, maybe a mobile device, maybe a desktop computer, could even be another, um, could be an unmanned computer. All right? For example, Google crawling the web makes requests to web servers looking for so it can index things. But at any rate, whoever the client is, is connected through the internet to a server, the client makes requests, the server responds to the request. Now, what does a request consist of? The request consists of a URL. We gotta know what page we're hitting or, or whatever. At the very least, it's going to have that. It has to have that or it's not a request. It's going to have maybe data from forms, maybe on the query string or maybe otherwise. So, for example, if you do a Google search, part of your request to Google server is the stuff you put in the query string. And then there is a whole bunch of other stuff. And for lack of better words, we'll call them environmental variables. And they include things such as the IP address, where you're at, um, the platform that you're running, the browser that you're running, and a bunch of other stuff. These things are, for our purposes, most critical. The server then can take our request which consists of form data, URL, form data, and environmental variables. And it can work its magic by running a script and interacting with a database. So for example, Let's compare Googling something with on, on, on a mobile device versus Googling something on a desktop. All right. If we type in 
using Google.com, we make that request, the server may actually route us on a mobile device to amgoogle.com. How does it know that? It knows that because those environmental, environmental variables tell it that we're on a mobile device. So it can actually send us to a different script than what we asked for um, by redirection. It also can take our IP address and use that to figure out where we are located. All right. Your IP addresses are assigned to your internet service providers. So it probably knows here at LC that we're in Elyria. It doesn't necessarily, it isn't necessarily able to pinpoint exactly geographically where we are. It knows that we're in Elyria. But you know, it might say that we're in Sheffield Lake, or it might say we're in Lorraine or Amherst, depending on where the hardware for the internet service provider is, all right? Or where the IP address is registered to. The server does its thing and returns a package of stuff. And that package includes HTML, JavaScript, and CSS. What we're going to talk about, our focus is going to be on JavaScript. HTML and CSS, you probably learned in CISS, 216, and we just had a bit of a refresher course on this. And you should always experiment with it and try it. Remember, it works best when you cleanly separate the HTML and the CSS, where the HTML is the content, the CSS is the appearance and the layout. That's like our assumption. If we do that, then we're in good shape. All right? JavaScript we're going to talk about now for the next while, because that's another client-side tool. So instead of following the orders uh, of the chapters in the book, I'm going to do all the client-side stuff first, then I'm going to do all the server stuff. Now to be sure, some of the techniques we're going to use isn't so straightforward. There's a bit of it on the server, a bit of it on the client, and for those I'll just, I don't know, flip a coin or something and decide. But we're going to do the client-side stuff first. All right? So. Let's talk about both the client and the server, the impact on mobile web pages. We talked about the server already, and we'll have to put that on the back burner for a while, but just sort of keep this on the back of your mind, and, and we'll review this when we get into the server-side technologies. The server-side technologies, what is the impact of that for mobile development? Well, we have a lot of information as part of this request that the server can use to dynamically create the page that it's going to send back. Remember, with server-side scripting, you don't have a completed web page. You have a script, a little program that runs and produces, as a response, HTML, JavaScript, and CSS. Now, we can gear that response to any number of factors, our location, platform, and so on. So the information that comes as part of the request is used by the server to sort of customize the HTML, JavaScript, and CSS that it's going to send back. All right? So you, you go to Google on a mobile phone, you get redirected to m.google.com. You visit on a desktop, you go to just plain google.com. Now, What's the impact of this? Well, again, with our starting assumption that we're having a good separation between HTML and CSS, we can use responsive techniques with our CSS, which is all the stuff that we've learned so far this semester. Everything that we learned so far in the semester falls under the category of responsive, H, you know, responsive uh, web pages. So with the HTML, we want semantic. In other words, our HTML reflects really the meaning, and we don't have anything relating to the appearance or layout in HTML. CSS handles all that, and we make our CSS responsive. That is, we use percentages, floating, all that sort of thing. And then we saw how we can include media queries to provide a different look for mobile versus uh, desktop. Whether we use the graceful degradation approach or the mobile first 
progressive enhancement approach. Now, JavaScript can help us in a couple ways. All right. First of all, JavaScript can help us. Um, we'll talk about a couple different ways that it can do that. We'll do that over the next few weeks. One thing to remember is that JavaScript happens without going back to the server. So there's anything you can do via JavaScript is sort of a win-win situation because it happens immediately and you don't have to go back to the server. Now here's the interesting thing. When, we, when, when, when people started taking websites and making them mobile friendly, a lot of what people did is simply make a smaller version of their regular site. All right? But we saw why that is not necessarily the best approach. Right? We know that people accessing a website via mobile have, are likely to have different goals than people that are accessing the website through the desktop. Again, the example of someone visiting the college website. All right? People visiting the college website from a mobile device are probably not investigating their, which major they should take. Probably not. They're probably doing things like, I need the phone number of the library to find out what time it's open to today. Or, um, you know, um, is, is the weather, you know, is school canceled because the weather's too nice today? I would love for Dr. Church to do that once in my career, say, it's just too nice to have classes today. Everyone go home and, and we'll, we'll pick it up again tomorrow. But I don't think that's going to happen. But, on a more serious note, to see if the, if the classes are canceled once we get into the winter and it starts snowing and all that. That would be uh, one thing that, that um, someone from a mobile device would use. So, our goal is not to simply take a big website and make it small for mobile. All right? Our goal is to make a mobile experience for the user that serves their needs, just like the desktop serves the needs of the desktop users. In some regards, mobiles have an advantage over desktops. All right? What might you think would be an advantage that a mobile device has that a website could take advantage of as compared to a desktop? People are more likely to buy off a mobile than a desktop. Yeah. People always have their mobile with them, so it becomes more sort of it becomes more sort of intertwined with their daily life, you know. Um, you have to sit down at a computer to do some things on a, on a website, but you probably always have your mobile device with you. What's another advantage that a mobile device has that we might be interested in taking advantage with? Most of the time it loads faster. It, it can load faster if it's written correctly. The other advantage is, is that there are some things that a mobile device has that a desktop doesn't have. A camera. Some, some desktops you can attach a camera to, or laptops have cameras, but mobile devices have cameras. Mobile devices also have GPS location, right? And that will prove to be an advantage because it, with a mobile device, a website can know exactly where you are and not approximately where you are, all right? And in some cases, that might be really beneficial for the website. So for example, a desktop making a request finds out where you are based on your IP address. And again, that's going to be approximate because that's based on your location uh, of your internet service provider, not your location. So. If I did server-side location detection, it might think, it, it would know that we were in Elyria, let's say. If I use the GPS aspect of a, uh, of a mobile device, it would know that we're standing in the BU building of Lorain County Community College. All right? So how can we use that to advantage? How could, for example, a mobile version of LC's uh, um, um, site use that feature to its advantage. Can you think of an example of, of like an enhancement that you can make to it? Well, I would say like if you're going to search computer lab hours, it would probably give you the closest lab between All right. the outreach centers and the main campus. All right. That's a good one. If you know, for example, you, you could, you could uh, if you were looking for computer labs, it could tell you which one's closest. And it would be accurate. All right, because it knows exactly where you are and not approximately. How long have you guys been students here? A few years, right? This will be eight years. Okay, so a few years. The first day here, was it difficult getting around? Pretend it was. All right. And I will say that even now, someone will say, 
something's going on in the culinary building. And I'm like, what? There's a culinary building? You know? So, while you yourself might not have had trouble getting around, you know, some people get confused between all the buildings and how to get here and there. Usually the first week of any semester, I get at least several people coming up to me. They see me, they assume, you know, that I look like a professor. So they ask me, gee, where is the such and such building? If they, one thing that they could do on our app is they could do a map, but an interactive map that was interactive based on where you physically were standing. And that's something we're actually going to do later on in the term. So, for example, you could, um, it could show you, you know, one of those, you are here, and show you standing outside of the fountain. And if you're looking for the UP building, it could highlight the UP building and show you where the UP building is, so you, you know which way you're walking. And as you were walking, you'd know if you're walking in the right direction, because if you're getting closer versus farther away. All right? So don't think of mobile devices simply as little computers. They have some characteristics that allow us to do some cool things that are not really possible in a desktop environment. All right? So, that, some of that, anyhow, involves accessing features on the client side. Now, I know you've all had me for several classes. I assume you both have or maybe are having me for 243. You've had 243, right? Um, in that class, I talk about a framework. All right, what is a framework? When I use the word, I say, you know, this kind of framework or that kind of framework. What is it? The environment which the IDE works in. It's the environment. All right. What what would a good framework provide for you? What would make a good framework if you're looking between two different frameworks? Controls. What about them? Yeah, a good framework helps you do your job, right? It gives you a starting point to do what you want to do, and then if you have to fill in the details, well, that's fine. You got to do some work, right? You know, you can't just let the framework do everything for you. So the idea of a framework is something to build upon. It's a starting point that you can build upon. You can almost think of it as like a template. It's something that you can build on. And in that way, you don't have to worry about doing some very basic functions that everyone writing applications does. All right? And you have this in Android. You have it in I iOS development. You have it in ASP.NET development, all sorts of things. Well, there's a framework within JavaScript called jQuery. All right? Any of you familiar with jQuery at all? jQuery is a way to do some things very simply in JavaScript. So, to write something to swap images. You know, there would be a handful of lines in JavaScript. That's not necessarily that difficult, but jQuery would provide you a very straightforward way to do that, or any basic sort of JavaScript functionality. Well, jQuery has a has a little cousin, all right, or a little brother, maybe, or sister, called jQuery Mobile. And jQuery Mobile is a framework for developing. It's a JavaScript slash CSS framework for developing mobile websites. And what's so great about that? We've been developing mobile-looking websites for a while. Well, the framework does some things for you, does things very easily for you, all right? And the jQuery framework, if you use it properly, will make web pages that actually look like native applications. So they won't, they'll look more like applications than they look like web pages. This is covered in chapter six of your book. And you can download the code and you can do this yourself um, to go through the steps involved. I'm going to sort of show you the final version of, of this, jQuery, and then we'll play around a bit with it and look at some things that, that we can do. All right?
righty, let's look. I have posted already in advance. In a perfect world, I would do this for every class, but posted in advance our example. And this example is me working through the chapter 6. All right, let's look at this page. I'm going to view it in Google Chrome. This is a web page, and they do an example of a company that sells um, Scottish tartans, all right, plaid stuff. And this is meant to be the home page of it. And on the web page, viewed within a browser, it looks like this. All right. Now, it's probably more exciting to view this within the emulator, though, because in the emulator, we'll see that it looks a lot like Where did it go? Oh, here it is. There. That kind of looks like a mobile website. All right. Or, I'm sorry, that kind of looks like a native application. So if I was viewing this on there, and when I say a mobile application, when this was developed, iPhones was the, the leader in mobile technology. So this kind of looks like an iPhone app. There's little bars down here that you can click on. And right now I'm getting an error, but we can go and correct that. But notice that we have sort of a mobile look and feel to this. All right. Let's look at what we have, and we can look at in more detail and see how they do it. To put jQuery Mobile in here, we need three files. And you can download them for free. It's legal. It's not like you know, you're stealing it. But in a minute, we'll go look and see where you can download it from and talk about that. But there is actually there is a CSS file. And there also is two JavaScript files that we need to put. I believe they need to be in this order, if I remember right. All right. Now notice that we're what's called hot linking to those files. Are you familiar with the term hot linking, what that means? It, yeah, right. If, if, if you do not need a copy of a file on your server, but you can use a copy of a file that lives on someone else's server, and you link to that, that's called hot linking. So, the jQuery mobile stuff, you can, you can access one of two ways. You can download these files and not hot link, or you can simply hot link to them. So, for example, here I'm using a style sheet, and I don't have that file. I'm not downloading that file locally. I'm simply pointing, and I'm hot linking to this file here, which exists on their server. Likewise with the jQuery code, and with the second jQuery mobile um, JavaScript files, 
it, uh, I've also not downloaded them. Now we could download them if we wanted to. We're allowed to do that, it's legal, and then we wouldn't have to hotlink. We could point to it on our server. But there's some nice character, there's some nice reasons to, um, to do this. They keep several versions of it. So in other words, if you develop under one version, if there's something in a new version, it won't interfere with what you've done before. All right. We'll look at downloading these files uh, in a minute. But again, keep in mind you don't have to. You can hotlink to them. Now, once we've downloaded these, the second thing we have to do is we have to put attributes on our HTML tags that sort of tells jQuery Mobile how to handle that particular tag. So, for example, notice that this div right here, we have a data role of header and we have a data theme of A. We'll talk about themes probably not today, but probably in a future class. A theme is essentially just like a color scheme. You could, you know, you could have a page with a different color scheme than the rest, in which case you could define a data theme A, a data theme B. Yes? Do you declare the data themes or are they automatically? Well, the A is, the A, I believe the A is by default, and then if you wanted an alternative one, a B one, you would go and make it. There's actually a little, little thing of code that you can put in. Uh, if we have time, I might, uh, we might uh, go in and make a theme. But yeah, it, by default you get the one, which is sort of the default color scheme, which, which you saw in that example. Probably the most important thing, though, is the data role. Because the data role tells the jQuery mobile JavaScript how to treat these. In a nutshell, here's what happens. And if this is a little fuzzy for now, you can just think of it for a little while just as being magic. But essentially, this snippet of JavaScript code, or actually, I'm sorry, that's the CSS. These two snippets of Java code, script code reads your web page and dynamically makes changes to your web page based on the data roles. So for example, let me go and let me eliminate those scripts. All right, so I take those scripts out. So there's no CSS, no JavaScript. My page then looks like that. All right. When I go in and put those scripts in, as the page loads, these two JavaScripts run in sequence. This one runs first, and this one runs second. And it applies different style elements based on the data roles, data themes, and so on. Let me do something else. Let me remove the data role of header from this. All right, and I'll save it, and I'll click refresh. Notice it didn't do anything with that. It didn't do like it did before, where it took and made um, that you know centered and with a certain look. If I go and undo that, now it knows that that's meant to be a header, and it will go and it will style it that, that certain way. Let's look at this footer. Let's say I remove the data role of navbar from that div. It doesn't know that to treat it like a mobile-ish looking navbar and therefore, it treats it just like a, an unordered list. I have a question. Yes. You say that we're using divs, so then are we not using nav section article anymore? Uh, 
the, no, we, we can still use that. It just so happens that the book example is not written via with, with HTML5. The, the book exam, th this is sample code from the book. So this would work, I would imagine, and we can test that if I go in and change this to a header, let's say. So if we were using the HTML5 things properly, we would not have a million different divs. We would have a, we would use the nav, the footer, the header, and the article. So it looks the same. All right. Um, I was just curious if it threw an error. No, that's 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 a that's an excellent question. Um, I believe the reasoning for that, and and the reason why I was pretty confident, although again not a hundred percent confident, but pretty confident that it wouldn't matter, is the fact that those data roles are what are critical. The data role is what tells jQuery Mobile how to handle a particular thing. All right. So the fact that we've defined that nav as having a data role of nav bar is what makes jQuery mobile um, treated a certain way. All right. Notice there's other attributes too besides the data theme which we, we talked about. There is, um, if we look at uh, the footer, data position fixed, all right? What that does is, in this context means it's going to put it at the bottom and, and leave it there. Um, how can I put this? I mean, I get it, what you're saying is that the information that you have in, within the footer section is going to be always based right. on the bottom versus a certain section of the page. Right. Um, let's put it this way. If you had CSS of your own that tried to do stuff with this, there's a possibility that the two would interfere with each other. All right. So in other words, if I knew I was using jQuery mobile with this, and I knew that um, you know, I wanted that footer to be on the bottom of the page like that, I wouldn't bother writing any style. I'd just let it do the styling for me. What I mean is It could get very confusing. You're absolutely right. Um, that's why the one thing that we're going to get to is at some point, web developers throw up their arms and say, you know what? It's going to be easier for me to write two pages, a mobile page and a desktop page. And of course, we're going to try to take some steps to make sure that we're not doing twice the work. All right, we're gonna to try to be very efficient about our code when we write PHP code using include files and things like that for shared code. 
But you're absolutely right. In, in a case like that, if you start throwing too many elements in there, um, yeah, you have the potential for, for a problem. I guess for the next few classes, we're really looking more strictly at the mobile side of it. And we're sort of putting the desktop on the back burner for a while. I'm getting an air load page here. What, I, what I'm going to do real quick is I'm going to create a about us. Actually, I'm going to create a find an event page simply by cloning this guy. I think it's called event. Let me look. Find event. I'm just going to put the text find event so we can keep this straight as being the find event page. Now, I'm going to change. Notice there's a class on here that's UI BTN active. That's a class that we can assign to the link of the page that we're on. So we'll notice that. We can, at a glance, know in the nav bar what link we're on. And again, this is sort of a hook into the J, uh, it's another way of hooking into the, the, the jQuery mobile framework through the data dash roles, et cetera, and through the classes. There's a certain, um, certain set of predefined classes that we can put in that will... Um, that, that we can use. Notice that in addition to this, the data role, there's a data icon for this. So we can specify a little icon for um, the different pages. So let me save that. Save that. All right, what did I do wrong? Event.html, and that is find event.html. Everything should be saved. All right, there we go. Honestly, don't know why we're getting an error on that. So jQuery isn't specific to mobile devices? Mm -hmm. You're in by desktops to them? Correct. Okay. Both jQuery and jQuery mobile. Okay. What's the difference between the mobile versus... Um, the, the mobile it gives the mobile-ish look to the page, whereas jQuery um, has things that are more geared towards desktop stuff. Okay, I think we're having a cache problem. How do I do that?
I did get it to work. What is it I wanted to do? If I open it in Firefox, for example, that works. Okay, I I I, I don't I don't feel like troubleshooting this. All right, so. What I'm going to do is I'm going to pretend this is my mobile browser, Firefox. Notice, as I click between here and here, do you notice how it's coming in? It's actually sort of fading out and in. So there's some little transitions that exist on these as well. Let's look at one of the other transitions that we can have, and that is slide up. So I could put on these links, data transition slide up, And notice as I click on that, how it goes and slides up. Probably. Let's let's see. I think I saved the one, but not the other. Yeah. Oops. There it slides down. There it slides down. Yeah. You probably even slide right or left yeah. if you wanted to. All right. So, how do you find out all these things that you can do? All these great things that you can do. Well, again, you know, you experiment, you play with it, um, and you go to the, the documentation that exists for it. So if I go up here, I could do a Google search for jQuery mobile data, I could say data roles and it will show me all the data attributes that exist. So I have data corners, and I can do this with a button. All right? And I'm just going to play around. I'm not going to do all these, but I think it's important, you know, keep in mind as always, you know, the intent isn't to show everything you can possibly do. The intent is to give you some examples that you can go and investigate and, and build on this. So. I could go in and let me make a button. I have another question. Sure. Since this is styling, um, when you want it in an external um, text file or whatever you want to call it. Well, it is. The, the, the jQuery code is in an external file. But technically we're writing it within our HTML. No. We're telling it what this means. We're saying that this, this is a nav bar. I want to treat this like a nav bar. Right. Now, how we choose to style and visually represent a nav bar, we're saying what it means. It's the code in this file, these files that actually make it look that way. All right, so again, this is almost, um, you know, we're not saying we want it to be red. We're not saying we want it to be, um, you know, uh, 
you know, with, with a box around it or it'll look like a button or whatever. We're saying that this piece of code represents logically this section of our page. All right. And then it goes and implements the code that it needs to do that. All right. Let me put a button on here. Not that we really needed a button. But I'll put a button here. Let me rephrase my answer. All right. Data role is we're explaining to it what role it provides and what it means. Some of the other things like data corner, yeah, stri strictly speaking, that is, that is something that deals with the appearance. So yes. Again, um, given, so if we decided, you're right, if we decided to switch all our buttons from having corners to not having corners, you're right, we would have to go in and, and code that and make that change. Corners. It, you know, it, it, it's it, in other words. Another way to put that is this is a, a trade-off. When you think of the, all the functionality you get for this, all right, willing to trade off maybe not following the standard best practices, guidelines for not having anything dealing with that in there. So yeah, that's an excellent point. All right, there's a button, and I can't tell if it has corners or not. At any rate, here's all the different things that you can do. So for when the data roll is a button, we can put these things. We could put an icon on it. So let's let's do that. Data icon delete. I'm not sure that corner business worked. a little icon for delete there on the button and so on all right so become familiar with both the data roles that you can have all right and the different other properties based on those roles Um, if, if you wanted to, uh, if you wanted to change the width, you could do it a couple different ways. You could, um, for example, change the data mini attribute to mini. Let's see what that does for us.
and that made it smaller this way. It didn't make it smaller horizontally. Um, let's see what I could do. I could probably put my own CSS code in here. To say button. Actually, that's an input. with 40%. All right, and that didn't do it. Again, those two are running into each other. So I don't know off the top of my head how you could make it smaller than that. The data mini does make it compact. Um, da oh, data inline, I'll bet. Well, these are, these are definitely good questions. And this is something that gets confusing again because you have style and appearance stuff coming from a couple different places. Let's try what that one does. data inline as opposed to block, which makes sense. A block tag would go all the way across. All right. Again, I don't know for the life of me why that's working that way. But within that, it works. Again, we'll see more examples of, of these things, but your, your hook into this is the data role to identify what that means, and then for each data role, there's a list of, um, there's a list of optional parameters that you can set. Let's look at... Here's an update of this, and you can either go and z uh, download all of the, the files, or you could hot link to them and copy and paste. So this is probably a slightly newer version than my code from a previous semester. So let's go in there and put that in. And I would hope it doesn't break anything. Exactly. All right. It does look different. This, dare I say, is a more modern looking application. This follows more of, if you've ever read like the recommended style guides for iOS development, this looks more like the newer versions of that. We could still go in and create the themes if we wanted to, if we wanted to have a different look at that. But this sort of gives the, um, the, the more cleaner, sleeker um, appearance. Now, when you, if you download the files, there is a regular and a minimized version. The minimized version, they simply eliminate all white space, which means that it's impossible code to read. But since you're probably not going to be changing it anyhow, you're simply going to use what they gave you, that's okay. You save a lot of bytes. And if you have a site that gets a lot of um, hits to it, that can, that can save your server a little bit of effort by downloading smaller files. So that's why you notice these 
we're downloading the, we're using the min versions. There'd also be the .js with no min, um, and those represent, again, the full code. So if you ever want to like look inside and find out exactly what these scripts are doing or exactly what these styles are doing, you have those. And you could do that. You could edit it and make your own version of this if you didn't like their default for certain things. All right? And I guess that's another option for you. It would be you could download uh, that and, and make the changes. Like, I'll go in and download. Instead of code linking them, we would just do the um, file directory. Yeah, you download them, put them in the, in the same folder or create a special folder for them and go and edit them. The problem with editing them then is you're kind of locked into that version or you have to remember what changes you made. Right. So for example, if they were to make an enhancement to jQuery Mobile um, and I changed the original source code, if I downloaded the enhancement, I'd lose the changes I made. Part of that you can, uh, you can mitigate by um, not, uh, uh, you know, by, by documenting what you did. Well, um, it's up to you. This is a JavaScript code, so you can see exactly what it does. And this would be the CSS. Yeah, it, it is. It is. <laughs> And of course, you can also apply your own. So there's a lot of options of stuff that you can do. In my use of this before, again, the one thing I found out is things can interfere with each other. So if you do something in in CS in your CSS, um, it's possible that something it did um, will interfere with it. Any questions at this point on any of this? Your next assignment is to take your first page, which is about responsive development, and give it a mobile look using the jQuery mobile framework. So you'll have a navigation bar on the bottom of your screen, just like I do. It's not going to go to three of your pages. It will go to three external pages. All right. And uh, it will have a mobile look and feel. I would suggest you use the latest version of jQuery Mobile um, and either download the files or hot link to them as opposed to using the files that I used in my example. You might as well be using the newest instead of, instead of older versions. Oh, if I, if I notice here, uncompressed without a theme. Okay, so that might be beneficial if you wanted to do something really on your own. They, they eliminate the, the theme and then you can, you can style it how you want to. All right, this is just the tip of the iceberg. All right, um, there's a lot of neat features with this to like the ability to write collapsible code to where you can click on um, a header and have a paragraph appear underneath it, and then click on a header again and make it disappear. All these are things, are, are aspects of um, the jQuery mobile that we'll investigate in, in future classes. All right. That's all I had for today. Um, if you are not staying for lab, we'll see you on Wednesday. I to Okay. Were you staying Phil or no? Yeah, yeah.